Let me ask you a question. Can the college entrance exam change your fate? No, you have to work hard to change your fate. Let me ask you, can the college entrance exam really change your fate? I don't think so, I took it myself. I used to think that knowledge could change my fate, but not anymore. Back then, I scored over 670 points in the exam. Didn't make a difference, did it? Now, I'm working for a ride hailing service. It's mainly about making money, isn't it? Nowadays, it's so hard to make money. Degrees don't matter much. Lots of college graduates can't find jobs. I studied logistics at Tianjin University, a second tier college. Many people at our station have degrees, but honestly, I don't think education is that important. You need to keep up with the times. 20 years ago, it might have changed your fate, but not now. So what do you think can change your fate now? I don't know, just have your dad be an official. In the past, people used to say going to college changes your fate, but fewer people believe this now. Among China's wealthy individuals, few graduated from prestigious universities. Many went to ordinary universities, and quite a few didn't attend college at all. From the perspective of ordinary people, most people's income and achievements aren't closely related to the ranking of their university. Of course, it's also widely believed that having a useful father is more helpful for employment and career development than going to a good university. In the past, children from ordinary families could move upwards by striving hard, gaining opportunities to enter quality private enterprises, foreign companies, or work abroad. However, now the private economy is struggling. Foreign companies are withdrawing due to geopolitical and structural reasons. Therefore, today's young people are desperately trying to enter the government system. But this system is dominated by the offsprings of CCP officials. Even if ordinary people manage to get in, they usually end up as low-level clerks, not much different from working anywhere else, with little chance of achieving higher social class. The leaders of the Chinese Communist Party recognize the benefits of democracy in the United States. However, they consistently portray America negatively to the Chinese people. The purpose of this is to maintain their own regime. In other words, China is currently a country that safeguards only the vested interests of itself, and all its systems are designed for this purpose. This can be seen in how school admissions depend on household registration and employment relies on connections. The competition for the college entrance exam is immense, which is the first hurdle. The CCP differentiates the exam papers by province into eight sets, but it's clear to those who can see that this is a fast track for CCP leaders. If they can't ensure basic educational fairness, it raises doubts about the communism they preach. Students who manage to overcome these difficulties and get into Peking University or Tsinghua University face severe unemployment issues. Nowadays, graduates returning from studying at Harvard or Yale are working in district offices. What about everyone else? The college entrance exam is not about selection, but elimination. The university entrance exam questions are not the same nationwide. Although the Chinese College Entrance Exam, or Gaokao, is held on the same day across the country, each province has its own set of exam papers. It is said that this approach allows the exam questions to be tailored to the abilities and conditions of each province. At first glance, this seems reasonable, but as a result, there is no national ranking, only provincial rankings. Universities recruit new students based on quotas allocated to each province and city. For example, in 2013, Peking University offered 218 admission spots for Beijing, but only 85 spots for Henan province, which has the largest population. The more remote the location of one's household registration, the fewer spots available, making it even more challenging to get into Peking University. Even if the 86th ranked student in Henan is more capable than the 20th ranked student in Beijing, it doesn't matter because there is no national ranking. From the outset, this system limits opportunities for students from remote areas to escape poverty through education, while favoring students from cities like Beijing, Nanjing, and Tianjin, who are considered more cultured and have better chances of getting into top universities. Some might think, since admission is based on household registration, why not just change the registration location? In China, the location of one's household registration is crucial to a good life. Take the college entrance exam as an example. Beijing, as the capital of China, has the best educational resources in the country. Without a Beijing household registration, one cannot enjoy compulsory education in Beijing. Moreover, Beijing's entrance exam uses its own set of exam questions, different from the national exam papers used in other provinces. Many exam takers believe that the entrance exams in Beijing are much easier. 
According to statistics from 2019, the admission rate for Beijing students to the two prestigious universities, Peking and Tsinghua University, was 1.26 percent, whereas the admission rate for students from Shandong Province was only 0.3 percent. However, the number of examinees in Shandong is 10 times that of Beijing. No wonder people often joke that Beijing students only need 400 points out of the full 750 points to get into China's top universities. The household registration system in mainland China significantly protects the interests of the elites by concentrating limited resources in a few major cities and restricting the number of people who can share these resources through a difficult household registration process. What is left for ordinary people are the bureaucratic hassles and trivial matters of government office red tape, along with the collective punitive effects of the household registration system. Due to the overly complex residency policies, many young people can only follow their parents' hukou, which is the household registration booklet. This often results in a single hukou containing not only the household head and spouse, but also adult children and even adult grandchildren. If someone is labeled a stability maintenance target, others listed on the same hukou booklet might be subjected to interrogation and harassment, which is the so-called collective punishment of nine generations. Here, poor quality doesn't mean you're not capable; it means you don't have the right background. This applies to school admissions and even more so to company hiring. A capable person from a rural area can't compare to a less capable person from Beijing. Whose parents are government officials. In this context, connections are very important for both education and employment. People have shared online that there are two ways to get into a university through the back door: find someone within the university or someone from the provincial admissions office. The people in the provincial admissions office have a lot of power and control some internal quotas. Even if your score is high enough, it's not a guarantee that you'll be admitted. Some also say that if you have connections with the National Education Committee, you might secure special or reserved spots. Getting into a government job definitely requires connections. For example, getting a ticket into such a position costs 150,000 yuan, around 21,000 U.S. dollars. This isn't the money for gifts; it's the fee you pay if you know someone within the government agency who allows you to give gifts. And this entry ticket costs 150,000 yuan. A man from Shandong abandoned his secure government job in China and moved to California to join the security forces. When asked why he came to the U.S., he said it was because he had lost hope in life back home. If you're a government official, they treat you like a human being. If you're a worker, they treat you like an animal. This year, finding a job is incredibly difficult. A thousand times harder than finding a partner. A friend asked me why I didn't look for a better secretary job and instead went back to working night shifts at my old factory. The reason is that I couldn't find a good job. I had been frantically sending my resume to major job websites, but the reality is that good jobs are never posted online. Online postings are usually for positions that couldn't be filled through referrals or for temporary work. All the recruitment processes are just for show. I thought having the ability would land me a good job, but having connections always trumps ability. The night before an interview, I practiced a lot at home. I woke up early the next day, put on a suit I bought from Ping Duo Duo, and caught the 6 a.m. subway just to leave a good impression on the HR. The HR just glanced at my resume, asked about my work experience, mentioned the salary, and told me to wait for a notification. Two days later, I got a call, and they politely told me I wasn't suitable. Finally, I realized that all the interviews were just a formality. They organized interviews for over a dozen people just to make it look legitimate for the person they internally recommended to get the position. Thinking back to my high hopes of finding a good job, riding 46 subway stops, it's really laughable. I lost this game of connections fair and square. It's like my former university classmates who had worry-free lives during college. They didn't need certifications to prove their abilities because they had fallback options. Right after graduating, their families arranged positions for them at universities in Tianjin or directly into well-known state-owned enterprises. But for someone like me with no background, I can only count. Carry my resume and look for jobs everywhere. In China, the act of using connections and improper means to achieve personal goals is commonly referred to by ordinary people as going through the back door. Getting into school, finding a job, becoming an official, and even dealing with criminal incidents requires going through the back door. 
For example, in the case of scandals involving Chinese officials, many high-ranking female officials have risen through unspoken rules. There have also been reports of people being promoted due to strong backing, sparking continuous public debate. Many online users believe that nowadays official promotions no longer rely on academic and career experience, but have evolved into a different set of rules. Some even sarcastically comment that society has become like the world depicted in the Ming Dynasty novel Jin Ping Mei, where society is characterized by moral decay, corruption, and decadence. The Twitter account Douban Goose Group Daily strongly criticizes the competitiveness of university entrance exams, arguing that using these exams as a means to climb the social ladder. Particularly through the national civil service exam to enter the government system, now offers very slim prospects. They also cited previous scandals, such as the sexual scandal involving Dai Lu, the deputy director of the business bureau in Guangdong District, and Li Chubin, a member of the standing committee of the Communist Youth League in Ganzhou, Jiangxi Province, whose academic credentials were questioned. Clearly, these individuals did not rise to their positions through academic achievements. The commentary sarcastically notes that in this country there is another set of rules. In Ganzhou of Jiangxi Province, Li Chubin became a member of the Communist Youth League's Municipal Standing Committee at the young age of 21. His personal resume shows that he started working at 15 and only has a junior college degree, leading to suspicions of falsified credentials and powerful connections. This has prompted sarcastic remarks from netizens. In an era where everyone can go to university, suddenly seeing a post-year 2000 junior college graduate in office is quite disheartening for those post 90s with doctoral degrees. In Yangzhou's Guangling District, a female deputy director of the Commerce Bureau was exposed for having started working at 18, having changed jobs six times, and transitioning from a non-staff position to a formal one, becoming a deputy director by 28. This is simply astonishing. Recently, the drummer Geng Shengzai from the Chinese mainland band Schoolgirl Bye Bye made a late-night post revealing that during her university days, her father allegedly used his connections to modify her GPA so that all her grades were above 85. She even thought, "How is this possible?" Later, her father arranged a job for her at a TV station, bought a house nearby, and told her. This is how your life will be from now on. Cherish it well. Why are poor people poor? This question shouldn't even be a question, because in a normal societal structure, as long as there is basic social fairness and equal opportunities for everyone, allowing individuals to rely on their survival skills to thrive, having both poor and rich people is just a normal social ecology. However, a relevant survey report draws significant attention. The 2010 China Residents Quality of Life Index survey report pointed out that about one fourth of respondents felt poorer than those around them. When discussing why they are poor, people tend to blame broader social factors such as the social system and social climate, rather than personal reasons. The survey also indicated that when exploring the causes of poverty and wealth, there is a widespread value recognition of connections and networks. Whether in urban or rural areas, the primary reason people believe they are poor is lack of connections and networks. A Taiwanese writer has a unique observation: to gauge a society's progress and civility, a simple way is to see what methods people use to solve their problems. He found that in mainland China, when people encounter trouble, they often do not first seek out a lawyer; instead, they rely on various social connections, such as through acquaintances and friends. To navigate official channels and resolve their issues, the backdoor deals are just the tip of the iceberg in the rampant cheating culture in Chinese society. The book *The Ultimate Mission of Communism* reveals the root cause of these societal issues. The Communist Party maintains its rule through violence and deceit, with lying being one of its specialties. People who grow up under the system lie easily and without any guilt, leading to a society where deceit is pervasive. From public life to family interactions, countless lies saturate Chinese society. The most severe cases of using connections and backdoor methods occur when Chinese officials collude with gangs. 
For example, the widely discussed Tangshan Barbecue Restaurant assault incident highlights this collusion. This incident occurred in the early hours of June 10, 2022, at the old Hancheng Barbecue Restaurant in Lubei District in Tangshan of Hebei Province. A man named Chen Jizhi harassed a female customer in the restaurant. When his advances were rejected, he and his friends brutally attacked the women present. Four women were violently beaten, with one woman in a white dress being dragged by her hair outside the restaurant and continuing to be assaulted for three minutes. The Tangshan assault case following the Xuzhou chained woman incident became another social case that sparked collective outrage across China. Among the four female victims, two left the hospital after treatment, while the other two, who were more seriously injured, remained hospitalized. During this time, none of the victims made any public statements, leading to rampant speculation and rumors on Chinese social media about their actual injuries and post-incident treatment. Unverified claims circulated, including rumors that some of the women had died and that the perpetrators were still at large. It wasn't until August 29th that the Hebei provincial authorities announced that the two hospitalized women had been discharged on July 1st. However, questions remain about the victims' true experiences and whether they are under pressure to remain silent. Due to official restrictions on interviews and speech, these details remain unknown. The Tangshan assault incident drew significant attention to the issue of local criminal gangs and corruption. In response, the Hebei Provincial Public Security Department launched the 100 Days Operation to crack down on crime during the summer. The Hebei Provincial Commission for Discipline Inspection and Supervision conducted an investigation and uncovered the protective umbrellas behind the 28 people involved in the case. They initiated investigations against 15 related personnel, with eight public officials implicated in abuses of power, bribery, and other issues. From the central to the local level, the support or indulgence of criminal gangs is actually the biggest protective umbrella. This verdict did not further pursue the protectors of these criminal forces. This is the dark space created under China's governance. And within this dark space, corrupt officials dare to challenge the limits of human decency without any fear. It's not poverty people fear, but injustice. What should be emphasized is the survival plight faced by the second generation of the poor. This issue not only concerns this group, but more importantly, it represents a tragedy for the development and progress of Chinese society. A significant portion of talent is found within this group, and stifling their growth opportunities is equivalent to stifling China's future. These are fundamentally systemic issues. Under an autocratic political system, almost all Chinese people, including most officials, have lost faith in the party. If there is no fundamental reform of the political system, then more CCP officials, wealthy individuals, and the middle class in China will abandon autocratic China for democratic Western countries after earning or accumulating substantial wealth. However, the lower echelons of society who lack such opportunities may resort to retaliatory violence against society as a response. Uh-huh.